even though a lot of you have said that the question paper was easy, it looks like uh, so far whatever I have checked, it was the answers are not so great. And uh, one comment was that uh, the question paper was too lengthy to be answered uh, in the given time. So that was there to to avoid uh, any kind of cheating, which could have happened. But even simple questions, um, I I think there was uh, I do not know why. So for instance. In the set, or in all the sets, these questions were common. So, for instance, uh, I have asked you to give an example of slip system in BCC. So, some people have written ZNS and something, and slip system in HCP, they have written magnesium. So, is it confusing? I don't think so. Slip system in HCP, you have to give slip system. So slip plane and slip direction, that is what slip system is. Right. And has anyone solved, did anyone solve that question of crosshead velocity? Okay, anyways, so we will we will discuss question paper also when I show you the answer stuff. Okay. So let us begin. today I'm say I, I, I probably will share another recording uh, which will be on the same topic you can see the screen right yes sir okay yes sir <clears throat> okay all right so what happens is that uh, usually materials they deform and they fail so that is their life cycle. And uh, they deform in a different way. They deform elastically, so permanently, and they deform temporarily, so elastic and plastic. So creep is also a plastic deformation. And uh, viscoplasticity is also a kind of permanent deformation, but it is time dependent. So there are different ways materials can deform. We usually stick to metallic materials which deform by dislocation movement. So the plastic deformation happens by the mechanism of slipping. <clears throat> also in uh, amorphous metallic materials, it if there is any plastic deformation, it happens by slipping. You might be thinking because it is amorphous, why should there be plastic deformation in the form of slipping? Because in amorphous material, you will have short range ordering that short range ordered structure you will have dislocations if you don't have then it, it will be absolute breaking of the bonds and therefore you will not have any elasticity at all sorry any plasticity at all fine so we have when we test something in tension let's say so we have stress strain and then we load it so it goes elastically then it starts plastically deforming, it reaches a maximum value. Not necessarily this will be true for all the metallic or crystalline material. You might also have certain phenomena like this. You might have a softening. And in, in all these cases, it will attain a place where, from where the load bearing capacity will continuously decrease. Okay, so if you unload it, for instance, here, you will get the same slope as here. But when you reload it, you will not get the same slope. So that's a different thing. And then when you unload it here, here while unloading, you will not get the same slope because the material has lost its uh, modulus, its load bearing capacity. And that is happening because of damage only one student was could answer this in the lab viva anyway so this is what happens with the materials right and this is what happens when we are dealing with a material where there is no macroscopic slope right but we will come to this 
macroscopic flaw. Flaws are there at different uh, scales. So, for instance, a point defect is also a flaw because uh, surrounding to that, you have atoms and one atom is missing. So, that's a vacancy, that's a point defect, and that is a flaw. But that flaw we are not discussing. Then you can have a flaw at a different scale, which is dislocation, stacking faults. You can have a flaw even at higher scales. So you can have small voids and you can again have flaws at even higher scale, which will be uh, a crack, for instance. So, okay. So one question to you is why do you think plastic deformation is important? Why do we study so much about plasticity? Do we ever use it? It's like it's like studying uh, complicated mathematics and then saying that in real life we never use complex numbers or integration or differential equation and things like that. Do you think plastic deformation is used? Sir, strain hardening. Yeah, where do you use it? Where do you use the strain hardening? You have a lot of structures around you, you know. You are using a lot of metallic materials around you uh, in bigger forms, right? You have bridges, you have pillars, uh, various things. But any of those sir, things, have you seen them plastically deformed? Sir, yeah. forging, I, I guess some material processing techniques. I'm not sure, sir. Yeah, that is one application. Correct. That is one application where you are making something. And for making something, you have to permanently deform. So if you have to bend something, or if you have to make utensils, then you have to deep draw that thing. So there, you have to deform plastically. Apart from that, so in real structure, in bridges, in, uh, for instance, in the, in the gymnasium machines, or in the cars, or in the trains, you don't see plastic deformation. Because you don't want the plastic deformation to happen. Because if that happens, then things are on the verge of collapsing. So why do we study plastic deformation? Because in emergency situations, a material might go plastic deformation. For instance, if there is a, a yeah, yes. So to know about the consequences that might happen. What consequences? Like for a bridge, it might collapse under certain conditions. So to know what extent it can handle this. Yeah, that's what I was saying. So you are you are you are right. So in those cases of earthquakes and tsunami, or in combination of these two the bridges might cross the limit of elastic deformation and there there you want to make sure only one thing is that the bridge will not fail so it might plastically deform but you don't want plastic deformation in, even in that case but the worst case should be plastic deformation and not the complete failure okay so so this part you want to increase But you will be working in all your lives and only in this, only in this part, not in, not in this part. Okay, so let me stick to the topic. So, so today we are going to look at certain features which appear when certain things or, or metallic material fail. So this is my tensile sample, which is a cylindrical bar. For instance, and when it necks, it will look like this. Why it necks? It necks because why it necks? Sir, the strain is highest uh, between the strain is high, highest in between the rod or anything. The strain is highest, and then why it next? Sir, so because uh, the uh, the point at the middle basically 
it has to go upwards and it can go upwards and uh, downwards so both side the uh, stresses are high so that's how it should just, it it should just snap why should it snap okay so what yatin was saying is about constraint that certain points have a lot of constraints that they cannot move not upwards and downwards yatin but it cannot move in any direction and that is true for the exact center point okay. but a little bit true also for the surrounding points it's not that the constraint is highest at the center but it is it decreases slowly uh towards the surface so material in the middle have to flow and they have to decide which direction to flow right and they cannot decide it so what happens they separate so you have a lot of you know i'm going to atomic scale which might not be true because that is not happening at that level the phenomena happens after too much deformation but what happens is that so this part and this part they are being pulled apart and so they will separate and they will separate not in this fashion they will separate like in the form of small very very small voids and this is true for the tile materials only okay so what will happen in the tile materials is that there will be excessive dislocation movement and excessive deformation and what is happening in that deformation is that atomic layers are moving over each other but to what extent they can move so at some point all the dislocations have moved right in a local area and then there will be separation and a small separation will cause small void to form and so these kind of voids will be forming adjacent to each other and slowly if you keep on increasing the load you will see small voids like this and then you keep on loading so so this is a picture which i have taken this one is a picture imagine this to be a picture which i have taken at certain value of stress here and then i increase the load and i take the picture again and then you will see more voids okay and then i take another picture and the load is constantly increasing so on the stress strain diagram we are somewhere here so here this is the first picture then second picture then third picture and here you will see small voids and big voids okay and then if i take another picture there fourth one then you will see bigger voids like this and you will see a little small voids like this and then you will see small voids like that okay so what is happening is that here small voids have started appearing here the concentration of the voids have increased here what has happened is that many small voids have joined together to make a bigger void and the same phenomena here has happened as a larger scale okay but still what is happening is that still you will always have smaller void formation and this will begin in the center of the specimen and slowly this small voids you will start seeing in the later pictures in at the surface area surface so closer to the surface also so in first picture you will see the small voids only at the center in the second picture you will see the concentration increasing in the third picture you will see bigger voids but the smaller voids also in the fourth one you will see much bigger voids at the center and uh, a little bigger voids apart so a little away from the center and very small voids towards the surface and then what will happen is that you will see a big 
much bigger void which cannot be called a void anymore so this is now a micro crack okay and all these things are ideal why because it is happening at center it may shift from center if you have an inclusion for instance so inclusions usually are not in the good shape so they are they might have irregular shape like this okay so so this tip will act as a stress raiser this tip will act as a stress raiser and because the stress will be higher at the tip of this inclusion in comparison to other areas where there is no inclusion so this will cause so you see at at certain scale you can have a look at this inclusion as as a discontinuity so what is an inclusion inclusion is usually oxides right or sulfides so uh, for instance if you have magnesium sulfide manganese sulfide and sulfide inclusion is there so this will obviously have a different crystal structure from your steel uh so so it will not be bcc so the dislocations which can move in bcc will not be able to move here so they will all get piled up so now this boundary between the the bcc grains and the inclusion tip is now exactly like an incoherent precipitate only difference is that this inclusion is larger much larger in volume in comparison to a precipitate and precipitates usually are not in that bad shape because they emerge out of the material and this one is there because of the manufacturing defect because you know some oxides got trapped some sulfides got trapped while the making of steel and so what happens is that in in those cases when you have certain uh, manufacturing defects in the form of inclusion oxides or graphite in 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 in, in cast iron in those cases <clears throat> in those cases this phenomena of uh, more damage at the center will shift to that area where you have inclusion so for instance if the inclusion is here so you will see bigger voids coming up next to it instead of coming at the center okay and this micro void will form here rather than forming at the center so in a very ideal situation where the your material is completely homogeneous only then you will you can expect the thing to start at the center and so once the micro crack has come up here now the stress here will be too high it will be too high and you will see why it will be too high in presence of a crack in the next lecture but right now you can or maybe we will talk about it i do not know so in the presence of this crack the stresses are too high which cannot be which cannot be taken by the material anymore so now material starts flowing from all the direction okay and this is a rectangular piece so if it would have been a cylindrical piece you will see a radial flow from all direction and this is why you see necking in the material Okay, so now now probably you can imagine what is happening to the material. Okay, so this is the where is this part? This part is at the at the neck region. So here I have taken this picture. Okay, so this is the this is the section here. So this is X, this is Y, and this is Z. then this one is x z plane okay at the center of, of the cylinder so what is happening is that you have a micro void here micro crack sorry not micro void micro crack and 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 adjacent to that what do you have adjacent to that you have bigger voids right at the center to that what do you have you have a little smaller voids it's not that they are so isolated from each other you still can see you still can see smaller voids here also you will see them everywhere okay but the concentration will increase 
as you go radially outward. So you will see smaller voids here. And you will not see anything beyond that. Why? I'll tell you why later. Okay. So this is what you will see. And at certain point, what will happen that now material will give up. At some point, it cannot take the load anymore. Right. And when that happens, the complete thing will fracture into two pieces. Okay. So the upper part and the lower part will be, will be uh, separated. But they will not separate like a plane. They will not separate. They will, it will keep on making. Okay? So it is a very ductile material. It will keep on making like this. Right? And usually, so if this is uniaxial, it is uniaxial testing. So you have maximum principal stress, which is equal to sigma yy and sigma 1. Right? And other stresses are 0. Right? So you don't have sigma z. You don't have sigma x. So basically, you don't have sigma r, right? That is the case. But as soon as you have a void, as soon as you have a void appearing in the center of the specimen, now you are not anymore in the uniaxial regime. You have a triaxial state of stress. So you will have finite value of sigma xx, sigma yy, sigma zz, right? And the maximum shear stress will be somewhere in the middle of these two. So you have sigma 1, which is the maximum principal stress. And you have sigma zz. And you have maximum principal, sorry, maximum shear stress coming up somewhere in between them. Right? Is this part clear? Because if you, if you remember, how do we define shear stress is the difference. Maximum shear stress is the difference between maximum principal stress and minimum principal stress, right? So somewhere in between you will be getting. Now I can have not only one combination, but I can have different combinations of the direction of shear stress. So I can have shear stress in this way. I can have shear stress in that way, in this way, and in this way, okay? And, and this is on a two-dimensional piece of paper, but you can imagine it radial, right? You can imagine this thing to be radially symmetric, so axisymmetric. So these are the possibilities of the shear stress, which is too high in, in those directions. So what can happen is that this material can break like this. So this is the upper part and this is the lower part or it can it might have gone to certain deformation like this so you only have this part which has snapped and rest is like this right so you can have something like this or you can have something like that also Or, so all, all possible combinations you can have, you can have, sorry, this looks very brittle. So it will not be like this. It will be first necking and then something like this. And the other part will be like that. Okay. So this is called cup and cone. So this is cup, this is cone. So cup own factor okay and when you test the same piece of if it is a steel if you if you test if it is a bcc steel or bcc alloy and if you do the same testing at very very low value of temperature then that same thing will act very brittle so there what will happen is that you will not get fractures like this you will get fractures like that so it's still in the maximum shear stress direction, but but too limited necking, you will see. In many steel grades, you will still see, even at lower temperature, you can see a lot of necking. And it, in cast iron, you will see this phenomena even at room temperature. So that is about brittleness and ductility. So what happens is that 
this ductile material will be fracturing like this and now you know what is happening inside the material so let us look at this picture again in xy plane okay so this thing i want to look in xy plane how how will it look like so let me draw that It will look like this. Okay, so this part I have drawn. This part I have drawn here. So what actually is this? So there are smaller voids, right? So these were the smaller voids which have broken from, which has broken somewhere, no? And then they, you had bigger voids, okay? So those are these voids, and then you had a micro crack at the center, which is this, and then you have bigger voids, then you have smaller voids. Okay, so all those voids, these are the voids, right? So they have broken, and this is what you see. You see broken piece of void. This broken piece of void, once looked from top, will look like will look like craters, right? So they will look like uh, like what you see on the moon surface. So they will look like craters, which are called dimples. They are called dimples. <clears throat> okay, and uh, uh, size or average size of the dimple. In this area, in this area, can tell you something about the materials resistance. So how much, how much material is is causing resistance against the load applied? Why? Because if the material is causing too much resistance, if material is not giving up too easily, and that can happen at different levels. So material can show resistance. Material can show resistance. Uh, so damage will initiate. So void formation will initiate a little before the ultimate tensile strength. So, so here somewhere the damage, let's say, has started. Void nucleation has started. And then what happens is that the material is now offering resistance at this level. Okay. So that means the slope is going on and on and on and on. So if material is causing resistance at this place, then what is happening? What could happen? What could happen if the material is too strong, then these voids are not, or I mean, material, if material is too ductile. So in that case, it will not happen. If material is too ductile, what might happen is something like this. Ideal plasticity. So material is able to deform too much. In that case, what will happen? The void size will not grow too much. So the voids have appeared, and the concentration of these voids will keep on increasing, unless you know a, a maximum area or maximum volume in the center of the specimen has been consumed by, on an average, same size of voids. These will not grow because the matrix surrounding these voids can deform too much. Okay, so the strain will keep on increasing, but the stress will not increase, and therefore the void size will not increase. What else can happen is that these voids they coalesce and they make bigger voids, and then they don't increase further. Okay, so you will see a constant concentration of certain size of dimples or certain size of voids and then it remains there for a very long time and if you still keep on increasing the load at some point what will happen that the con the, uh, the volume will be consumed by this size of this size of voids and then they will join together 
if you look at too closely to this these are two voids right although they are okay so these are two voids and the material between them is like a tensile specimen can you can you imagine that huh? can you see that happening so locally if you just look at this part it is like a tensile specimen it it is like a tree <clears throat> okay so so this is getting elongated and elongated so this is getting elongated so what is actually happening is that the voids are increasing well that is not actually happening actually what is happening is that this material between these two voids is getting extended so when it is getting elongated this dimension will decrease right so the wall between two voids is decreasing decreasing and then they will snap and this thing will break from here okay so if if this stretching offers too much of an elongation then what happens is that you you will see bigger dimple sizes not this big but you will see you will see these blue ones more in number and then green one and very less number of the purple ones because they are very small and they will grow very soon so it depends at which stage the material is offering resistance and this is the representation of how much tough a material is and therefore it is a signature first of all the signature of ductile failure is dimples dimples are the signature so if you see dimples which you cannot see in optical microscope you can see in optical microscope but not dimples you will see something else and in if you see under scanning electron microscope then you will see dimples and these dimples are signatures of ductile materials and you can uh, measure the dimple size average dimple size and that can be correlated to the fracture toughness of the material so not k and c because it is a ductile material J one C will be of J later on, so this is related to the fracture toughness. Sometimes it has been related to K one C also. Okay, you will not see dimples in cyclic loading. You will not see dimples in the brittle material. You will see dimples only when it is monotonic loading for the tile materials. Okay, and then there are certain other signatures which you will also see. You will see void formation like this. when the material is in isotropic and so the material can elongate in this direction rather than so even the stress is applied in this direction the material is is elongated in that direction and if you if it breaks then you will see dimples oriented in certain direction okay so that signature tells you about the rolling direction of the material so if the plate of the steel has been rolled in certain direction then you will see the dimples getting oriented in that direction so that is the representation of an isotropy okay and the other thing which actually comes out of this uh, this arrangement of dimples and can be related to material property is called the fractal dimension of the fracture surface so what we are studying today is what signature do you see when you look at the broken sample under optical microscope or under scanning electron microscope and that study is called fractography okay and uh so when you look at this thing when you when you look at this this thing or this thing under optical microscope from the top you will see so what what do you think you will see you will see a damaged region which will be looking very dull which will be looking very uh, not very bright and but you will see a fibrous region and this is called fibrous region and similar things you have seen in the impact testing broken specimen so you have seen a lot of dull region which is very uh, 
very rough. So that roughness is coming because of the broken dimples, and uh, that is causing the dullness of the area. And this is why it is called the fibrous region. And then you will have a radial region surrounding that where where the material has failed in 45 degrees. Or in the direction of maximum shear stress. So this part I'm talking about. So this 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 part is the, is called the radial region. This part, okay. So this has gone in approximately 45 degree because of the shear stress. So what has happened is material was not able to take load, and then this this micro crack propagated until this point, these these points, and after that it broke in shear. Okay, so this part is called shear lip. Shear lip, and and then in the middle you have a radial zone, and then at the center you have fibrous region. So, so this is shear lip. Then you have a fibrous region where you have second average size of the dimples. So fibrous region. Oh no no radial region radial zone radial zone and at the center you have very dull and fibrous fibrous region and the amount will vary depending upon how much tactile or how much brittle the material is so the amount of shear lip the amount of radial zone and other things will Keep on changing depending upon which stage of damage has taken more time or, or more amount of strain. So the phenomena which I described earlier is void nucleation, meaning appearance of void. That is the first stage. The void start appearing. Right. So the separation in a continuum of material starts. That is void nucleation. Stage one, stage two is void growth. So they grow, and stage three is void coalescence. Okay, so a void has nucleated. More voids have nucleated. They cannot join straight away each other because there is too much material between them. So they will grow, right? And then they will grow. they will grow and and they will grow to the extent when they have very small material left between them and then they will this piece of material will snap and they will join together and they'll become a bigger void so that is void coalescence so void coalescence also cannot happen unless it grows to that value so nucleation growth and coalescence and these three are the stages of the ductile damage behavior okay so i hope these things are making sense to you so far okay and 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 a little bit about a little bit about the fractal i will talk so uh, fractal is a concept which does not belong to fracture mechanics and but it is uh, so so okay so i'll try to give you an example very fast so suppose suppose this is the coastal line of an island okay this is an island and you have sea all around it and this is the coastal line right and you want to measure that what is the length of this coastal line do you know what is the length can you measure it if you want to measure it so let us define uh, let us define a scale by which i want to measure it so i define a scale in the form of a boat i say that i will keep a boat here okay this is one boat two boat three boat four boat five boat six boat seven boat eight boat nine boat 10 boat 11 boat and so on and so forth so i get let's say 50 boats so 50 boats is the length of this whole periphery of the island okay now the second king king comes who is the king of this island so this is a good story i believe and he does not have the bigger boat so he uses a smaller boat okay so for him 
the same periphery might be 150 boats but these boats are different boats right and then somebody comes and he says that no i want to use a math stick a math stick to measure the coastal periphery and for him the coastal line will be infinity okay <clears throat> at this length of boat what looks a straight line to you because you will be looking at that resolution but if you have to measure it through a math stick you will be zooming in and when you zoom in you will see a lot of roughness here okay so what was a straight line for the boat is not a straight line for the math stick so this length will now increase because you have this this length this length this length this length this length this length, this length and so on and so forth now you zoom into this i cannot zoom in anymore but if you zoom in again you uh, will again find roughness in that small local region okay and this is called in in some cases it is similar so in some cases what happens is that i'll give you another example you take a tree okay you you take a branch of the tree so i cannot draw this this is a tree okay and you you break a branch of this tree and look at that branch and that branch also looks like a tree and then you take the branch of that tree and you look at it very closely and that also looks like a, a small tree and you keep on doing this and you will keep on finding sense of tree in that so this is called self similarity okay and the self similarity you find at discrete levels so if i break the branch uh at a certain place then i will not find the self similarity okay so i have to break it at at a unique place to get this so that is discrete levels of self similarity i'm finding but in this coastal line example you will find this to be continuous so you look at any scale you will find the self similarity or one thing where you can find self similarity is the fibonacci series so so basically a spiral so you zoom into it you will find the same spiral you zoom out you will find the same spiral so that's the shape of the galaxy and there are a lot of things uh, the the snail structure is also in this form <clears throat> so this is an example of continuous self similarity okay so all these things are can be defined in the form of fractals and that is the concept of of uh, of the fractals so what fractal says basically is that a very flat surface is in two dimension right and a very uh, cuboid kind of thing is in three dimension and a straight line is in one dimension but what about a rough surface so according to fractal a rough surface is not in two dimension neither it is in three dimension it is somewhere in between and therefore the concept of fractal dimension a dimension which is fractional so this is not two dimensional entity neither it is three dimensional it is 2.5 2.6 2 or 2.2 dimensional entity and the self similarity gives a unique value to this so so the they you if you find out the fractal dimension of this coastal area you will get one value of this fractal dimension irrespective of where you are measuring it and similarly for tree is another example so same thing you can do with the with the fractal surface of this tactile material and you take local area take the sem image find out the fractal dimension of that rough surface and that will give you a, a one unit one value it will not change if you if you take the image anywhere else it, the fractal dimension will not change and that value can be related to the fractal of it okay so i think i conclude today's lecture here and this does not happen in brittle material and brittle material instead of voids you have micro crack they join together and because you know you don't have much time for the voids to grow and fall and all those things cannot happen because matrix cannot deform for such a long period of time 
Okay, so you you can think like two voids are there, and then the material between them cannot take too much load. Okay, so they don't need to grow too much. They don't need to grow. They can just join because the matrix is very brittle. So they are not. They don't open up like voids. They open up like micro cracks because a little bit of opening and material between them gives up. They join together, become a bigger crack, and that's how in the brittle fracture, uh, the things break. You will see in the lecture, which I will upload, is that uh, in brittle fracture you will not see signature like uh, like dimples. You will see tongues, and you will see cleavage. Uh, in in cleavage fracture, you will see river patterns. Those are the signatures of of cleavage fracture or um, what do you call it? Brittle fracture, but those cannot be related to the fracture toughness, and that's the major difference between uh, between the fractographic information which you get from the ductile material in comparison to what you get from the brittle material. So ductile material can be related to the material property, which is fracture toughness. But cleavage fracture or brittle fracture surface cannot be. So far, it has not been related to. I, I should say that because there could be a relation which people have not found so far. Okay, and we will see. You will see uh, why there are uh, those facets formation or river pattern formation uh, in in the brittle fracture. Why that happens? Like you had an explanation here. Of the uh, of the specific kind of feature you see, you will also have a logical reasoning there. Why do you see? What do you see? Okay. So with this, I conclude today's lecture. And do you have any question? If you have any question, we can still entertain for five minutes. Are you guys there? Hello. Looks like. Have you slept? I think they have left. Yeah, then. Yes, sir. Sir, I basically I went. Hmm. Sir, I went outside. I wasn't there. Good. <laughs> How long were you out? <laughs> Two three minutes. I'm not sure. Sir, basically today we were shifting. I uh, I got uh, my quarantine days over, right? So basically it was very hectic today. Okay, okay, all right, fine, fine. Okay, so I will upload this lecture also, the older lecture also. You can watch any of these two. So you shouldn't feel like you have to watch two lectures for one day. Okay, you can either watch this one or you can watch. the other one but i will upload both versions and okay so if you have any question or others have any question you can also message me post me post on the class okay sir i wanted to ask yes. something uh, after uh, after this recording basically for some okay. kind of uh, internship related internship related okay i will stop recording I don't have an option here.